Welcome back to episode 129 of Podcast Royal. How are you, my friend? I am doing well. How are you? Good. Big week for me last week, but um, all good things and everything is settling in. It's I'm listening to the rain outside my window right now and just rolling on through the week. It's good to be back with you. And we do have some some really tough pieces of news this week, but some good pieces of news. So I'm excited to dig into it all with you. Me too. We're kind of all over the place this week. There's news from all different corners. So there is. Why don't we go ahead and jump in? I think some of our listeners might be excited to know that we have a bit of British segment today. Your co-host is also excited that bit of British is back today. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it short with just a little, uh, some fun facts here. So last Friday was St. David's Day, and I thought, what better opportunity than now to talk about whale for our listeners? So mm-hmm. I personally have not been to Wales. I don't think you have either, Rachel, right? I have not. Nope, I have not. I would love to spend some time there. You know, if I ever get a chance to, you know, I hope to make it back to the UK before too much longer again. Um, But I did come up with some fun facts to share about Wales. And I found these on, I think it's it's a website called sykescottages.uk.co. So thanks for for the fun facts. But here we go. We've got six to share. First up, Wales has a population of 3.1 million, which is 4.6% of the UK population. I personally didn't know there were that many in Wales. Did you? No, I really don't. uh, Sadly, I really don't know a ton about Wales. I mean, I know what I know because of, you know, the Prince and Princess of Wales visits there and then before them Charles and Camilla but um I, I'm excited to learn more because you've talked a little bit about Wales on the show I think I think you've talked about St. David's Day in the past but it's always yeah. interesting to learn more well I thought this is a fun fact because it does relate to our royals so there are seven cities in Wales there's Cardiff Newport Swansea Bangor St. Asaph St. David's and Wrexham. And Wrexham is actually, we'll talk about it later on, but it's the newest city in Wales. And it came to be following the city status competition that was actually part of the late Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee in 2022. Mm. So the competition was basically a competition that required local areas to, they were basically competing with each other to become an official city. And in order to do that, they had to illustrate how the uniqueness of their community made them deserving of city status. And Wrexham won the competition. I know about Wrexham only because of their football club and Ryan, Mm -hmm. who is one of the owners of that football club. I watched the show on H or not HBO, Hulu called, I think it's called Welcome to Wrexham. Super fun show. Okay, so next fact is the corgi dog, who Queen Elizabeth loved so much, originates from Wales. And these cute little dogs date all the way back to the 10th century. I didn't know the corgi was from Wales. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay, so fact number four, Wales has more castles per square mile than any other location throughout Europe. And it's earned the nickname Castle Capital of the World. That's cool. That makes it like even more of a fun place to go visit if you're a castle person. Now I really want to go. Okay. So number five is it's the only country in the world with a continuous marked path around its entire coastline. So the path runs for 870 miles, which I say is quite the afternoon walk. (laughs) Yeah. That's like my rest of my life and I would never finish that. So (laughs) here's a tip. Don't start walking on the path thinking you'll just hop off whenever it comes to an end because you won't. (laughs) You're going to be walking for a long time. (laughs) And our last fact, which is probably the funniest, is Wales is home to a town whose name I'm not going to try to pronounce. I didn't even spell it out here, but it's the town with the second longest name in the world. It's got 58 letters in its name. And it was actually... Did you say something? I said, what? That's crazy. Oh. <laughs> and, I, well, and I'm also baffled that there's a town with more than that. <laughs> like that's the second right? longest spelled name. 
Yeah, so it was actually given this name to attract tourists in the 1800s, and it did work. A lot of people come to see the town and the sign with the name on it. So the name itself is actually in Welsh, but it translates in English to mean the Church of Mary in the hollow of the white hazel near the fierce whirlpool <laughs> and the Church of Tosilio by the Red Cave. What? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that doesn't even make sense, let alone the 58 letter word. Wow, that's well, a mouthful. Rachel, you asked. So, if you were wondering, the town with the longest name in the world is located in New Zealand and it has 85 letters in its name. What? That's wild. <laughs> okay, that's 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 wild. <laughs> That's well, there's your there's your bit of British for the week. So everyone should have plenty of uh, table topics to discuss at dinner time. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. And now I've got to go Google both of those towns. But that's really interesting. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. You want to go ahead and jump into the Royal Rundown? Yeah, we've got some things to get into. Yeah. So a few weeks ago, we shared a statement released by the Prince of Wales on the crisis in the Middle East where he said, and I'm just pulling a clip here, he said there's a desperate need for increased humanitar humanitarian support to Gaza and that it is critical that aid gets in and hostages are released. So following that statement, it was announced that the Prince of Wales would be attending two engagements to learn about the human impact of the conflict. The first being the British Red Cross, which we actually did discuss here on the podcast. And then this week, he attended the second of the two engagements where he visited the Western Arch Marble Synagogue in London. And this was actually originally an engagement planned as a joint engagement with the Princess of Wales for Holocaust Memorial Day. But in light of Catherine's medical leave, they postponed it until this week and Prince William did attend on his own. While he was at the synagogue, he actually met a 94-year-old Holocaust mm -hmm. survivor, as well as some young volunteers who work to um, put a stop to anti-Semitism in their communities. And he actually made a comment. He spoke for himself and the Princess of Wales saying, anti-Semitism anti has no place in our society. Both Catherine and I are extremely concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism. So while we're really chatting about... I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm really glad he's speaking out about that. That's really important. Yes, absolutely. And I was waiting to see what that second engagement was because they did announce at the time that there would be two. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting um, and, and incredible that there was a 94-year-old Holocaust. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. I'm, I'm actually watching a show um, called The New Look on Apple TV+. Plus. It's about Coco Chanel and Christian Dior, and it's um, it's set during the Holocaust and it's very, it's very harrowing. So, um, that's, that's amazing that he got to meet with her. That what an, I'm, what an honor for him. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, I mean, I think most people would say what an honor for her to get to meet Prince William, but what an honor for him to get to meet her. Absolutely. Well, let's go back to Wales for a second. So Prince William actually traveled there this week, I believe in honor, or I guess it was last was it last Friday, last yeah, week, last in Friday. honor of St. David's Day. Um, so like we mentioned, if you listen to the podcast, you've heard us talk about St. David, who is the patron saint of Wales. And William was in Wrexham, the new city, at All Saints School. And I just thought this engagement was so cute, the photos that came out of this event. So you can see in the photos, the Prince of Wales, um, is there at the school with, with all the children. And, you know, we do often see Catherine doing engagements with young children, but we don't often see William, especially on his own. And mm -hmm. I just thought it was fun to see him smiling with everyone there. And it looked like he was really enjoying the day. One part I especially loved. So he was given a few gifts to take home to Catherine and their children. Um, I think he got a, a big bouquet of red and white flowers um, and then I saw in one of the photos, the children were giving him some red dragon stuffed animals for mm. George, Charlotte, and Louis. And the uh, the red dragon is actually, it's on the flag of, of Wales, and it's like an official symbol of the country. So there is some meaning there, um, but just really cute photos from that event. 
Yeah, and I saw that he was given flowers for Kate at that engagement on Friday, as you just said. He was also given flowers for her the day prior as well. He visited the synagogue, as you mentioned. So later in the day on Friday, after his visit to the school, he we were just talking about Wrexham AFC Football Club. He visited there, and he, I think, I believe he was on his way in. He was, it was from just someone that was just an onlooker and was asked pretty pointedly about Kate, and, and he just, William just did not answer Uh, and that's you know what that's his right to do I think the palace has said what they need to say about her health I think I mean I I think you will agree with me that for when we talked about this briefly last week there was definitely a huge fever pitch around her health and and it just escalated and escalated especially on social media we'll talk about that more in a minute I know you have an update for us on that but just like we said last week The palace was very clear all the way back to January that we would not see Kate until after Easter and Easter falls on March 31st this year. So April, essentially, I don't really get this, this fervor. I don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll chat about that when we get to some of our next stories, but I totally agree with you. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get into it, but, um, our next news item is difficult. There's just no two ways around this. So last week, Jessica broke the news about Thomas Kingston, who is the husband of Lady Gabriella or Ella, and it his cause of death was announced this week. And so this is this is difficult to talk about. I, I even think I said last week, you know, there's no way that it could be this. And then it potentially was this. And it's, it's just very hard to talk about. So I, I do want to put a note in here that this next news item mentions what is likely believed to be a self-inflicted death. So if that is a topic listeners that you are uncomfortable hearing about, or that might be triggering for you, please just go ahead and skip ahead to the next segment or the next news item. And obviously we hate to report on this news as it is just so tragic and sad, but we talked last week on the show again about the the death of Thomas Kingston. Um, He was married to Lady Gabriella for just shy of five years. They were married in May of 2019 and he was only 45 years old at his passing. So when we recorded last week, we did not yet know his cause of death. We weren't sure if we would ever know. Since then, more details have come out, and we know from an inquest that Thomas died at his parents' home in the Cotswolds. We know that he died of a traumatic wound to the head. Um, a gun was found nearby. He was alone. This is all from the inquest. So, you know, it's it's difficult to not jump to conclusions. We're reticent to do that, but um, it it sounds it sounds like a self inflicted death. So what we what we do know is that Thomas apparently had lunch with his parents that Sunday, February 25th. After lunch, his father went to walk the dogs. When his father returned, nobody could find Thomas. And after about 30 minutes of searching, he was Thomas was found in a locked outbuilding on the property. And as someone who I, I, I think I mentioned this on the show, I'm sure I did. Um, someone who experienced suicide with in my own immediate family in the summer of 2022. So not yet two years ago, I, and again, we're reticent to say that that's what this was, but it, that is what it certainly appears to be. So I know personally the shock of such an unexpected death and the complicated emotions that come with losing someone this way. I actually, again, think I said on the show last week that there was no way he could have died that way as he was at his parents' house. I think I hoped for that to be true because, again, I I do know that pain personally, and I know many listeners out there do as well. I wish no one knew this pain. I would wish this pain on on no one else. So my heart, and I know your heart too, Jessica, breaks for, for Thomas, first of all, who if this is true, must have been suffering silently. My heart also, of course, breaks for Lady Gabriella, his Thomas's parents, his siblings, his family, his friends, everyone who loved him. And, you know, I obviously have no right to speculate why he did this. I wasn't privileged enough to know him. But in addition to his work as a financier, Thomas was a hostage negotiator in Iraq. He actually survived a suicide bombing in Baghdad that killed 22. And he was also said to have had countless brushes with death. And again, I'm not speculating as to why this happened because I have no idea, obviously. But that, of course, has to take a toll on a person. And my heart obviously breaks. I know I speak for you too, Jessica. For all who knew and loved Thomas, we just continue to send our love to them from afar. I really do feel compelled to throw this in here too. If you or someone you know is considering hurting yourself, there is help. There, there is help out there. 
The Suicide and Crisis Lifeline can be reached by dial in the U.S. by dialing 988 or by texting STRENGTH, the word STRENGTH, to 741741. So help is out there and you deserve it. So um, it's tough, Jessica, but do you have do you have any thoughts? You know, I'll echo what I what I said last week there. This family has just been on my heart and it is such, such sad news. So my thoughts and prayers are with his family and his wife as they grieve. Um, it's it, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, it's it's devastating and just no, no word. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. So let's let's move into some lighter news. So after carrying the lion's share of the work as far as senior royals go for most of 2024, Queen Camilla is on vacation this week. So her next plan engagement is not until Monday, March 11th, when she will lead the royal family at the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. Listeners, you know, if you've followed the royals for any length of time, this is a staple in the royal diary. So the king, by the way, will not be there in person, but he will appear via a video message during the service. So In addition to her own full diary of duties, Camilla has also taken on many of her husband's engagements after his cancer diagnosis, and even prior to that, when he was preparing for his procedure, uh, his uh, corrective prostate procedure, and she has really, really stepped up in light of the multitude of health crises in the family. So Camilla is said to have been encouraged to take the break by the king himself, and that she is jetting off somewhere sunny. So good for her. So in her absence, William, Edward, Sophie, and Anne will take up her engagements while she's away. And I read this and I agree. The fact that Camilla is going on holiday is a great sign. I think I agree with this of the King's prognosis too, as she would not never leave his side if the situation were more dire. So, so there's a bit of good news. So any predictions we know that we know that she's going overseas and somewhere sunny so any predictions on where the queen might be headed on vacation you know i'm not sure but i can't help but wonder if this feels like a true holiday i mean Mm -hmm. i do hope she's getting some real rest and relaxation But, you know, I think about all the travel that she does on a normal work schedule, and I sort of think if I had the time off from official duties, I might actually prefer to just relax at home. And I was thinking maybe there's part of her who wants to go to her country home in Wiltshire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, sometimes traveling for holiday can be a lot of planning and work in itself. So hopefully she's got some time. Maybe she's at a spa somewhere, laying on the beach or by the pool and just really unplugging for a little while. So hoping she enjoys that holiday. Well, we know Camilla hates to fly. So maybe you're right. Maybe she just is sneaking away somewhere she can get to by car because she's not, (laughs) she's not, uh, she does not like flying. So one more actually really interesting note about Camilla. So she's actually going to make history this month as the first consort to lead the ancient tradition of distributing Royal Mondi gifts. We talk about this, I think every year it's a big, again, a big staple in the Royal diary. So Camilla will do this on behalf of the King, who of course is still recovering following his recent cancer diagnosis and treatment. So Mondi Thursday is March 28th this year. And of course, Camilla has participated in the Royal Mondi service with the King before, but she's going to make history this year. So the Royal Mondi service is being described as the most significant Royal event that Charles will miss to date. The British monarch leads the Mondi service each year on the Thursday before Easter. As we said earlier in the episode, Easter this year falls on March 31st. And the service dates back all the way to 600 AD, traditionally sees the monarch distribute Mondi money or coins to local retirees in a parallel to Jesus washing the apostles' feet at the Last Supper. The monarch distributes gifts according to the number of years they've lived. So as such, ceremonial coins will be presented to 75 men and 75 women because Charles is 75 years old. So um, that's that's pretty cool. And, and that's some, I mean, if this service has been going on since 600 AD. This is the first consort to ever do this. That is pretty history. cool. Yeah. Wow. So, 
we'll we'll obviously report on that when it happens. That's in a couple of weeks. And more good news, actually. Speaking of good news, it still seems that the King and Queen's planned visit to Australia, which I'm sure we've touched on at some point in past episodes, um, it's planned for this October. It's still apparently scheduled to go on as planned, which again is a good sign of where Charles's health is at. So as you know, listeners, because of last week's episode, Australia is one of the 15 Commonwealth realms that also call Charles the King. And though other royal family members have visited since, in fact, a lot of royal family members have visited since then, there has not been a visit by a monarch to Australia since the late queen visited back in 2011. So they're due for a visit. So the king is expected to travel travel to Australia around the time of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which is going to be held in Samoa this year, which is also in Oceania, beginning October 24th. So that is a very good sign that that visit is still on. Well, and speaking of the king doing well, he was actually working today. I I don't know if you said you did. Okay. Very briefly, very briefly, but yeah. Yeah, he held a meeting at Buckingham Palace with Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, which this is a tradition for the king to meet with the chancellor ahead of the budget being presented to UK Parliament. So he kept his commitment. And yeah, we got a photo of them today. Yeah, I, I very briefly saw that come through. So that's all. These are all good signs. Very, very good signs. Well, let's keep rolling with the good news, Rachel. I like good I news. Like After this. that piece of tough news about <laughs> Thomas Kingston, I'm all I'm all for the happy stuff. So I've got some more um, good news to report, and I I guess maybe sort of a royal health update. So Mm -hmm. you kind of teed us up for this a little while ago, and I said I had more to share. So last week, the whole world was asking the question, where is Kate Middleton? And by the whole world, I mean that this search, where is Kate Middleton, really went viral. I mean, it was all over the internet. Mm -hmm. I saw so many people online and it was even people outside of royal content creators discussing all these crazy conspiracy theories Mm -hmm. around what might have happened to Kate Middleton following her surgery and why no one has even seen the tiniest glimpse of her since her Christmas Day walk to church in Sandringham. And Rachel, I have to admit, I know we chatted a little bit about this. Some of these conspiracy theories were really funny, uh, but some of them were actually super inappropriate and honestly just mean. Uh, But I'm happy to report that the Princess of Wales has been seen for the first time since her surgery. So paparazzi photos were taken of Catherine, and she was riding in the front passenger seat of a car, which was actually driven by her mom, Carol Middleton. And they Mm -hmm. were out in Windsor. She was in the car wearing sunglasses. But to me, it was very obvious. It was it was her and her mom, even though she had the sunglasses on, you could tell. Um, So I don't know. What did you think about that? that photo Rachel well, it was great so I counted it up it was yesterday the 4th of March was 70 days since Christmas day so we hadn't seen okay. her in 70 days um they were actually on the school run they had um I think they either, were either headed to Lambrook or they just dropped the kids off at Lambrook it was great to see her I mean and I, well you have thoughts on this and I'll, I'll weigh in after but it was really good to see her obviously she's alive she's not in a coma all of these stupid 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 rumors and um again the palace said that it was going to be this way so I don't know why everyone is freaking out but I know you have thoughts yeah so I had a few takeaways I kind of thought about this for a little while and first my first takeaway was I just think these conspiracy theories were so ridiculous yeah. at how they went viral. And there was a lot of criticism of Kensington Palace for not giving us more information about Catherine's health journey as, you know, we, we saw Buckingham Palace share about King Charles. But like you said, she told us up front immediately that she would be on medical leave for a surgery and she explicitly asked for privacy until she returned to work after Easter. And in my opinion, there's really nothing vague or cryptic about yeah. that. I immediately read that statement and was like, we won't hear from her until after March 31st. Exactly. Um, so, you know, why people feel they are owed every detail of her private health and even a photo of her in recovery, I I don't understand. She is not an elected official. I'll remind everyone of that. She's not head of state. 
Um, you know, any other person out there, if you took an extended medical leave for a health issue, I don't think you'd be expected to share photos with your colleagues or other people out there. Um, <laughs> hey, just give us a photo. Let us know you're okay and you're not in a coma. Like, yeah, I, d- I don't think you'd be obligated to share confidential details about your health. And I just thought it was kind of out of line for the public to expect Kensington Palace to share that information about her and to post recovery photos after a really serious surgery. And she's truly out of work right now. So yeah, she's um, trying to recover. She's trying to, to make herself healthy again. So leave her alone, everybody. Let her mend. Right. And and I just don't want to feed into the the viral conspiracy theory. So that was my first takeaway. And my second one is I, and I don't know if this is if this hasn't been, you know, really confirmed by anyone, and I don't know if it's if people are going to disagree with me, but I do sort of feel like Catherine and Kensington Palace um, knew that, you know, if she was out in a car riding around Windsor, she would probably get her photo taken by paparazzi. So mm-hmm. I think that may have been um, a response to them and trying to put these rumors to rest because it was really just getting out of hand. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I do agree with you completely. I do think time will tell if if that decision will be effective. You know, we've still got, like like you said, several weeks to go before she'll be back at work. But I mean, I do think it was a smart move on their part to let the public just see that she's doing well and she's okay. I still hate to see that, you know, she felt like she was maybe in a position that she had to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But it kind of goes back to that, you know, I think we've talked about it on the podcast before, but Royals just having to feed into this media machine to satisfy, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the media outlets and get them their photo. So I, I completely agree that, that she was seen on purpose. Like, I, I, I don't think that that was a coincidence. I think that it was like, okay, here she is now stop speculating. The only thing I can think of is that when William pulled out of that, um, service of thanksgiving for king constantine of greece at the last minute for quote-unquote personal reasons i feel like that's when this really amped up Mm -hmm. and i just don't understand why because like we talked about last week he could have what did you say he could have had a filling burst he could have had a cold (laughs) like who knows like why does anybody call out of work because of personal you know and once again if this were if we were having this conversation on may 5th instead of march 5th then okay maybe i'll give you that but they're literally doing exactly what they said would happen. And by the way, after the internet went mad about Kate last week, a representative for Kate uh, from Kensington Palace released a statement last Thursday, February 29th, that said basically what you just reiterated, Jessica, Kensington Palace made it, this is the statement, Kensington Palace made it clear in January, the timelines of the princess's recovery, and we'd only be providing significant updates. That guidance stands. So there you have it. So let's, let's let it go. We've seen her. She's obviously doing okay. And let's let her recover. To me, that statement tells us we should believe that no news is good news. Yeah, exactly. She's, I mean, yeah, I, I just think that it's much ado about nothing. And I'm telling you people that, that I never thought cared at all about the Royals have been coming out. I bet this is happening (laughs) to you too, are coming out of the woodwork. Is Kate okay? And I'm like, she had surgery almost two months ago and now you guys are concerned like what happened but yeah the internet has gone bananas um all right well Rachel I'm keeping our good news streak going so let's pivot and talk about the Yorks for a second um you know Fergie had kind of a, a tough start to the new year as well when she had talked about her melanoma diagnosis and she's recently shared that her skin cancer has not spread so that's so good very thankful for that. We learned that she had surgery around the edges of the side of the mole that had been diagnosed with melanoma. And from here, she has to have checkups every 12 weeks, but she's reportedly very relieved and she's keeping a super busy schedule. So no downtime for her. And I just think it's really fantastic that she's staying active during all this. I think that's a great sign. Yeah, I think I think we're getting actually great signs from everyone. So that's really good. We actually saw her last weekend. She was with Princess Eugenie and Jack Brooksbank at the F1 Grand Prix, um, and they looked super happy. So she and Eugenie were there. They were kind of in this dressy, casual, like skirt dress sort of outfits, and they had tennis shoes on. And I also saw a photo of Zara Tyndall at the same event. So Mm -hmm. royal 
a royal event, I guess. Yeah. Um, following the Grand Prix event, Fergie headed off to Australia, where she's been this week for Global Citizen Now. This is a summit dedicated to ending poverty. And I just have to mention here the most fun pair of shoes that she was wearing for an engagement in Australia. I actually loved her whole outfit and Rachel, I was going to put a photo in our notes and totally forgot, but she was in this mint green tweed dress and matching jacket by St. John, but she had the outfit paired with some pale pink flats and they were Mrs. Alice for French soul in the design, eat me, drink me style. So (laughs) Think very Alice in Wonderland vibes with like playing card designs. If you remember the movie, you probably recall the scene where Alice drinks the potion. Mm -hmm. So this shoe is kind of playing into that. Um, There were like one of the shoes had a little diamond, like uh, diamond and heart designs with a playing card. And it had an embroidered sign that said, eat me. And then the other shoe had like spade and, and um, club designs with a blue potion bottle that said drink me <laughs> so <laughs> very fun that. very whimsical I loved it I thought it was a great outfit choice <laughs> Fergie always like well not always but often she's done this before wears messages on her shoes I think that's amazing <laughs> I just love how she's just so her own person I really love that definitely and I'm so glad to hear that good news that's that's awesome. And um, so Friday, March 8th, this upcoming Friday is International Women's Day. If you've noticed over the years, listeners, Megan generally always does something to mark the occasion. And this year, I think this is super interesting. She's headed to Austin, Texas for the opening day of South by Southwest, or as it's written, SXSW, to keynote a panel about women in the media alongside Katie Couric and Brooke Shields. So the panel is called Breaking Barriers, Shaping Narratives, How Women Lead on and Off the Screen. The discussion will focus on how the ubiquitous nature of social media is creating an often dangerous environment, which has led to serious mental health issues for teenage girls in particular. And that's according to the South by Southwest description. So that is um, an exciting engagement for her. So she'll be traveling again this week. And okay, we're getting near the end of the Royal Rundown. So last week, We mentioned that Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Thompson, who uh, better known as King Charles's hot equerry, was (laughs) stepping back from public facing duties, how royal events just got a whole lot less handsome in the process. Well, no one can ever replace Lieutenant Colonel Johnny Thompson, but Kate has hired a new private secretary that, and by the way, this position has been open for over a year. So she's finally hired this position. And this man is... Uh, how shall we say he is also very good looking Um, (laughs) he actually resembles Roger Fetter the tennis player if you ask me and if you ask the internet so I did drop a picture in here so what do you this is a good looking man I mean he's not Johnny Thompson but this is a good looking man his name by the way is Lieutenant Colonel Tom White so I need your thoughts here Well, yeah, I do see the resemblance, at least from the angle of this picture I'm looking at. But yeah, he looks very nice. He's got this very classic British style, this little Mm -hmm. plaid blazer and a tie. Um, He's cute. The good looking man, my friends, he's a good looking man. So again, his name is Lieutenant Colonel Tom White. He was brought on Kate's staff at the end of February. So just within the last week or so. And uh, I do think that he does look like the tennis legend himself, Roger Federer. (laughs) Kate's actually friends with Federer, as we know. Um, We saw them at Wimbledon together last summer. They both enjoy tennis. Um, I mean, obviously Federer enjoys tennis. He made a career of it. He retired in 2022. Kate also plays tennis and is a fan of the sport. So Tom White is very familiar with royal life, by the way. He served as Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth's equerry before her death. He was actually on hand, and there are some photos of this, to greet former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson at Balmoral on September 6th, 2022, just two days before the late Queen passed away there. And then he um, greeted Liz Truss and her husband um, when when Liz Truss was named Prime Minister. So the Telegraph reports that he, Tom White, joined the Buckingham Palace team in 2020 after serving in the Royal Marines. He served in Afghanistan. So We've got some more eye candy. So that's that's the end of the Royal Rundown. And we leave you with some extra good and handsome news to, to walk away with. The legends are true. Overwhelming power. The sauce of destiny. Yes. 
The most legendary sauce has arrived as McDonald's transforms into the anime world of McDonald's. The greatest flavors unite in all new savory chili McDonald's sauce to make your 10 piece with nuggets, fries, and Sprite ultra powerful. Unlock manga comics with every meal and sit down for a new anime short every week only at McDonald's. Ba da ba ba ba. Go! I participate in McDonald's for a limited time while supplies last. This episode is brought to you by Tinder. Look, cuffing season may be over, but ladies, you can still get on Tinder and have some fun. It's the place to find whatever you're looking for, whether that's something serious, casual, or in between. Plus, Tinder has prompts and quizzes you can add to your profile to really help fuel the flame. Explore all the possibilities for yourself. Tinder, it starts with a swipe. Download Tinder today. Well, let's move on into Royals around the world. We have a few updates here. First up, while we're chatting health updates, which I feel like we have health updates every episode now, Rachel. Yeah, this is turning into a health podcast week <laughs> by week, but and I'm not I'm not too pleased about it, but here we are. So we've got we've got news on King Harold of Norway. Listeners, I know you remember last week we reported that he was hospitalized with an infection while on holiday in Malaysia. Since then, we have learned that while he was there, he received a temporary pacemaker after it was determined that he had a low heart rate. Doctors did confirm that he would ultimately need a permanent pacemaker, but thankfully he was able to be transferred to a hospital in Norway for that procedure. So I know it's probably a relief that he's back close to home Mm -hmm. Um, because it's a, it's, it's tough to be so far away from home when you're sick, Um, especially something that serious. I didn't know he'd made it back there. So I'm glad that he's back home. Yeah. So he is in hospital in Oslo currently. Um, He traveled there on a medical flight. Then he arrived at the hospital in an intensive care ambulance. And I did see some reports that a few members of the royal family have been visiting him in hospital, including Crown Princess Met Merritt and Princess Ingrid Alexandra. Um, And then as we mentioned last week, Crown Prince Hakan will continue filling in for the king while he recovers. And we have heard that the infection is under control. So that's that's good news. I was I got to be honest with you. At 87, I was a little bit worried about him. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for anybody, that's a serious procedure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad he's I'm glad he's home. I had not heard that he had made it back. So I'm glad he's home. So a little update out of Belgium. Queen Mathilde of Belgium has been in Côte d'Ivoire, which is also known as the Ivory Coast in West Africa this week. She was there in her role as UN advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. She met with the president and first lady, and then she visited a mother and child hospital where she got to learn about work being done to really reduce the mortality rates for mothers, newborns, and children. Um, And while she was there, she also visited an organization that provides shelter and care to victims of human trafficking and labor abuse. And then in keeping in her role um, focused on sustainability, she visited a kindergarten school And the school is actually constructed out of recycled plastic bricks by a company called Conceptos Plastico. So this was part of an initiative to construct schools in areas where education facilities are desperately in need. And they found, um, I guess, a really cool, sustainable and and cost effective way to do that. So pretty, pretty interesting engagement for her. That's awesome. I actually would love to visit the Ivory Coast. I, that's a, I want to visit everywhere, but um, that's really cool. Yes, uh, definitely. All right. So we also have some fun news out of Luxembourg. I this love week. when we bring up the Luxembourg and Liechtenstein royals because we rarely do that, but we still really like these royals. So that's cool. I know every time we have something about Luxembourg, I think of you, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, well, you know, I love Claire from Luxembourg, but anyway, I digress. Well, this past week, the Grand Duke and Grand Duchess of Luxembourg hosted the president of the Czech Republic and his wife for an official visit. The president and his wife were greeted with a military welcome at the palace, and they also met with the prime minister, as well as attended several other engagements, including a concert, a state banquet, and reception. And Rachel, we had a tiara moment. So tiara moment. Grand Duke Henri and Grand Duchess Maria Theresa hosted the couple, and there were some 
very beautiful pictures that came out of this event at the state banquet. They had to put some in our notes here for you to see that how the beautiful. tables are decorated. Yeah. We also saw Hereditary Grand Duke and um, Hereditary Grand Duchess at this event. Hereditary Grand Duke Guillaume, I think is how you pronounce that. I could be wrong. Guillaume, I think. I'm not 100% sure. Um, This name is actually the French version of the English name William. Did you know that? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so he was there with, as I said, hereditary Grand Duchess Stephanie. Um, and then Maria Teresa was in the Belgian scroll tiara. And hereditary Grand Duchess Stephanie was in the Chameau Emerald tiara. And the purpose of this visit was to strengthen Luxembourg Czech relations, specifically focused on digital technology, space, and defense. So we've got a lot of our Royals around the world focused on, you know, the future of technology. We had mm-hmm. our Swedish royals in California learning about AI. And mm-hmm. now we've got our Luxembourg royals learning about space. So that uh, that Emerald Tierra gives me um, Eugenie vibes from her wedding, doesn't it? It Yes, I thought the same thing. And I was thinking there's another tiara that's similar to that. And I'm trying to remember which family has it. And I'm like, maybe every royal family has their version of the mm-hmm. big emerald. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Okay, we've got bit of British and what the royal this is a great day. This is a great day. So what <laughs> make me make me laugh, take me out of take me I mean, we've actually had quite a bit of good news this episode, which is great. But let's let's have a giggle, shall we? Yes, we do have a what the royal moment this week that I put in here. So Rachel. I'm so glad you included this. Oh my God. Yes. This needs to be spoken about. Yes. The news is out. It is being reported that Gary Goldsmith, the (laughs) uncle of the Princess of Wales, is set to be a cast member on an upcoming season of Celebrity Big Brother UK. So for reference, Gary is Carol Middleton's brother, Catherine's mom. And he was actually a guest at the wedding of William and Catherine. Okay. So the reason I put this as a what the royal moment is because I was really surprised that he was going on a show like this. And he's actually already commented about the Prince and Princess of Wales in an ad for the show. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised because that's kind of his like claim to fame. So he's well, they, you know, I will probably say forcing him to. What, what he said was tame. So a, a little detail about some of his comments. He said, the first time I met William, Catherine was cooking and William said, hi, do you want a cup of tea? <laughs> okay. <laughs> kind of odd. All right. Kind of a weird comment tame. to share in an ad, but okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I was thinking I would have expected the palace maybe to like, I don't know, prohibit him from commenting about the royals. But then I did remember we've seen Mike Tyndall in in the reality TV space before. So, you know, I guess extended family members do have the freedom to do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Either way, I don't really expect him to share anything super private. Um, I, I mean, I do feel like regardless of how tame he is, Catherine would probably just prefer to stay out of the news headlines for a little bit right now. Especially right now. Even when she disappears, she can't escape it. So, um, and I I included this as well. He was also quoted saying, and I'm, I'm cutting pieces from his quote because it was longer, but some of the comments he said was, I often find that people think I'm a bit of a bad boy. (laughs) Winding up is probably, or winding people up is probably my favorite hobby. And then he said, every part of me is just riddled with mischief and danger. (laughs) So, Rachel, we will see what season 23 of Celebrity Big Brother UK um, has in store for us and how everything will play out. That's probably not (laughs) what you want to hear when your uncle goes on a reality show and you're one of the most famous women in the world that he is that every part of him is just riddled with mischief and danger. Oh, my. (laughs) We'll 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 stay uh, abreast on that space as the season goes on. I'm a little worried about that, but. Hopefully he keeps it together, especially right now. Come on. Right. He's convalescing. So, all right. Well, as we close the episode, this is not just the third and final part of the series within a series about the firm, but this is my very last Royal Potpourri 
segment ever. We've come to the end of the road with this segment. So I hope listeners that you've learned something and uh, we've just kind of been all over the place in, in this in this segment. But this is the very last Royal Potpourri, the final iteration of not just the firm series, but also the whole segment. So it's been a really fun series to do. I can't even remember how long we've been doing it, at least a month or so. Um, probably two months, but who knows? We may bring it back in the future, but for now it is uh, ending today. So let's talk about the Royal Archives. So the Royal Archives was established in 1912 and it occupies part of the round tower of Windsor Castle. So the archives are privately owned and access must be requested by researchers and an appointment for the keeper of the Royal Archives was made after Queen Victoria's death in 1901 to safeguard her collection of official and private correspondence. So collections in the Royal Archives include diaries, letters, household papers, administrative records, and a royal photograph collection that holds over, get this, 400,000 items of photographic material from the royal collection. I would love to have like a week. It it couldn't be an afternoon. It would be too much. Mm -hmm. But a week up in the royal archives, just to like, not even to write anything, just to look, you know, just like purely to like page through that. That's, That's a lot of information. And okay, moving on to... Next part, again, these are very shallow swims. We are just touching on a little bit of things that that wouldn't have their own segment, but fit under Royal Potpourri. So let's talk about historic Royal Palaces. So this, is, you've, I'm sure you've heard of this listeners. It's an independent charity that manages some of the UK's unoccupied Royal Palaces, like Hampton Court Palace, the Tower of London, Kensington Palace, which was occupied, but it's not at the moment, the Banqueting House, Whitehall, Kew Palace with Queen Charlotte's Cottage and Hillsborough Castle. So historic royal palaces was created in 1989. So actually relatively recently within Mm. our lifetimes. Yeah. And finally, royal parks. So I actually knew nothing about royal parks. So these are lands originally used for recreation, mostly hunting uh, by the royal family. These royal parks are hereditary possessions of the crown. They're now managed by Royal Parks Limited, which is a charity that manages eight royal parks and certain other areas of Parkland in London. The Royal Parks charity was created very recently, 2017. Parks include Richmond Park, Bushy Park, Hyde Park, we've heard of that, Kensington Gardens, Regent's Park, Greenwich Park, St. James Park, and Green Park. So that is it. Yeah. When I was in London, I had a lovely walk through St. James Park. That's awesome. Well, you can thank Royal Parks for that. Created in 2017. Well, that was in 2015 <laughs> that, that I was there. So yeah. I was there in 2015. So no thanks. Ooh, no, okay. just you did it on your own. You were an independent <laughs> walker through the St. James Park. Um, yeah. You know, you know something that's interesting, Rachel, you talked about uh, how there are over 400,000 items of photographic material. And something that I think about, you know, you know how people say like, you always want what you don't have, or, Mm -hmm. you know, I feel like there's probably a lot of non-royal people out there, just your average person who maybe is missing a lot of photos from their family history, and they would love to have something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think about the royals, and I think about how they have access to all of this stuff. And I wonder how much they look at it or I wonder how much they maybe wish every little piece of their history wasn't saved. You know, like maybe they they don't want everyone having access to all of their private moments over the years. So Mm -hmm. it's an interesting thought about how, you know, we – we, we want something that we don't have or, you know, everyone has a little bit different situation. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. good point. I, uh, as you're speaking, one of our guests, I think it was Sally Bedell Smith said that she got access to the Royal archives. And as I said, it's the top of the round tower of Windsor castle and how I'm pretty sure it was Sally Bedell Smith, how she had to remember she had to walk like up so many stairs. I to, do get, remember that. to get to get up there because like obviously I mean this is a historic building there's no elevators and so just how she like had like how it was a massive walk like once you were up there like she, you had to pack your lunch because you were not doing that <laughs> twice in one day so um super fascinating stuff again who knows we might bring this back in the future if we think of other things to say but for now 
that's it for Royal Pope Reese. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you did. Did you, I did, you know, you're a Royal expert, Jessica. Did you, did you learn things from Royal Pope Reese? I hope so. Oh, I think I told you every week I learned something That's new. Cool. I we learned, always I learned do. things too. Yeah. I learned plenty while researching that segment. So that was really fun. Well, that's that for episode 129. Um, be sure as ever to come hang out, out with us and see all the cool content Jessica's creating on our Instagram. That is at Podcast Royal. We love getting listener questions. If you have questions or any thoughts, feel free to DM us on Instagram. Send us an email at hellopodcastroyal at gmail.com. I can't even tell you listeners what an exciting guest we have for you next week. I mean, can you attest to that? We have, an, we have a major guest coming on the show next week. Well, are are we releasing that episode next week? Is that when it's going yeah. out? Uh, yeah. Okay. Next, okay. Fr- next yeah. Friday. So yes, we stay uh, tuned. We, yeah. Stay tuned for that. I mean, I'm not joking. This is major. Like I'm quaking in my boots a little bit, but I'm so excited. We can't wait to tell you about that. Stay tuned. As Jessica said, because you won't want to miss the interview. We'll have our regular episode next Wednesday and then we will um, have that interview run Friday. And thank you so much as ever listeners for tuning in to episode 129 of Podcast Row. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.